Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. In this lesson, number 152, I want to show you some techniques for modeling distributed workflows. You can get a listing of all of the lessons I do for Software Architecture Monday through my website at developer2architect.com lessons. A lot of lessons do come from these two books I wrote with my friend Neil Ford. Um, however, uh, this particular lesson comes from, well, before uh, I wrote these books with Neil. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, this lesson actually comes from a prior video uh, with a question in the comment section about my mentioning something called a business automation model. And the question was, well, what is this business automation model that you're talking about? Well, I answered the question in the comments, but I thought it might be useful to actually show that as a particular video. Modeling distributed workflows can be quite challenging, and I want to show you a technique for being able to both model and also manage the distributed workflows in things like microservices. So let's model a workflow for entering a trade and then correspondingly accepting that trade. So ultimately placing a stock trade. So it starts with somebody manually entering a trade into the system. Uh, let's say we want to buy 500 shares of Apple stock for a particular brokerage account. Well, the first thing that happens in our business workflow is that the trade is first validated to make sure everything's fine with the trade. If nothing is exactly correct, uh, then the workflow goes back to that person entering that trade to say, nope, there's an error. However, if it is valid, it goes on to something called pre-trade compliance to make sure that that trade is in compliance with regulatory rules uh, that exist. If it's not, then, of course, that error gets sent back to the person entering that trade. But if everything is fine, then that order is routed over to a particular trader. Now, that trader receives this trade order and then accepts the trade into the system, thereby placing it. Now, the workflow here is that first, the system assigns a particular block for that trade. Uh, that's a grouping of like trades, uh, maybe all buys or all sells or trades of a particular type of symbol. Now, once the block has been assigned, then the system recommends a particular broker um, based on the block and that trade. The trader then selects a broker and then places that trade by creating what's called a placement. Okay, there's our workflow. But here is our trading system. Notice we've got a user interface and all sorts of services are representing the various stages of a trade. There's a pricing service, there's a router service, a blocking a placement, pre-trade compliance, all of these different services that we have. The question is this, everyone. What is the communication between all these services? How do these services communicate between one another? Is there too much communication? Because we know in microservices, the more communication we have, especially inner service between services, uh, the less reliable, the less scalable, the less available, and the less performant our system will be. Um, which services interact with the user interface? Well, it's hard sometimes to answer these questions, and that's what I want to show you in this lesson. I want to show you an artifact called a business automation model, which helps determine not only our coupling level between services, but also how to manage workflows within our services. So <clears throat> what I want to show you is this bit of business automation model. It's an artifact that basically combines two things. First, it combines a business workflow model that shows the various stages or steps involved in a particular business workflow. Uh, this model is usually owned by product owners, business analysts, business sponsors, uh, those type of business folks. Now, also, we combine it with something called an enterprise system model. Uh, this is a model like I just showed you that shows all of our services, applications, user interfaces, gateways, uh, databases, etc. The business automation model essentially marries these two models together to show 
the business workflow on top of the various services that perform that particular function. There's a lot of benefits to this kind of model. First, I want to show you the model, and then I want to talk about the use cases and benefits of doing this kind of modeling. So let's go back to our workflow, our business workflow model for entering and accepting a trade. The business automation model really starts with kind of these rows. Each row represents a particular application or a particular service. So in our case, here's all of our various services that we have in our system. And notice everything starts with kind of a trade user interface. And then we've got all of our services kind of going down. Now, as you might guess, oh, and over here, by the way, are all of our workflow steps for this particular workflow of entering and accepting a trade. Now, as you guess, what we're going to do is put all of these various steps and model that workflow overlaid with which service has that responsibility. Uh, this not only allows us to identify the workflow and responsibilities of who should do that, but also potentially missing services. In other words, workflow steps that have no corresponding service that makes sense to do that piece. There's identification of services we may need to create, but also the duplication of responsibility. So let's actually start doing this. Uh, let's manually enter the trade order. That's kind of the start of our workflow. And so that goes up here at the user interface level. Now, the first step in our business workflow was then to validate that trade. Notice down here, we've got an order validation service. Makes perfect sense that that validation service should be the one to validate the trade. And so now we're starting to now model the workflow by showing the lines of kind of the flow of these particular workflows. Now we noticed that a trade may not be valid, in which case I'm going to show a direction going back towards the user interface of any errors that appear. Now if no errors appear, we do pre-trade compliance. We look through our list of services and we do notice right here that we do have a pre-trade compliance service. So that makes perfect sense to then assign that responsibility of that part of the workflow to that service. Now, if everything is valid in that trade, that trade validation communicates with that other service to then forward it to immediately do the pre-trade compliance without interrupting the user. Pre-trade compliance then communicates to the user interface whether the trade is valid and in compliance or not. Now, assuming it is, then we need to route that particular order that we manually entered to a trader. Well, notice we do have down here, I believe we have a service. Do we have one? So it doesn't make sense for pricing to route. Well, Pre-trade compliance shouldn't have responsibility for routing. Order, no, blo blocking, ah! But we do have a trade router service. Now, this is really useful, this kind of modeling. If we didn't have this trade router service in existence, but we did have a need to route, we notice, based on all the services we have, it makes no sense for anybody to have that responsibility. So we would have to create a new service. Okay, but since we have it down there, uh, let's assign the route uh, trade, or route the order to the trader. And that happens from the user interface. So the, the person entering the trade will then route it to that particular trader. Okay, the trader receives it. The next step is to kind of take the action to accept the trade. And that action comes from the user interface. In other words, that's a manual action that has to happen. Once the trade's accepted, the system has to assign a block. Now notice, we do have here an order blocking service. And that's used to analyze the various existing groups to see if it should fit, or maybe to create even a new group. So let's assign the block and have that responsibility be to the order blocking service. Once the block is assigned, notice in our workflow, the system immediately recommended a broker. Well, we do have a broker service, so I'm going to put that right there. 
And now notice that this step immediately goes without any interaction from the user to assigning the block to recommending a broker. Now, <clears throat> the trader must then select a broker. Again, that's an action that comes from the trader, hence in the user interface. And the recommended broker uh, uh, action, or I should say that workflow step, uh, sends that recommendation to uh, the trade interface. Well, once the broker has been selected, the next action that happens in the user interface is to then place the trade. Trader places the trade and the system creates a placement. But who should have that responsibility? And I see right down here, in fact, we do have a placement service. Makes perfect sense. And now we move that over there and that completes our workflow. And this is a good example of this kind of artifact that I'm calling a business automation model. It's a fairly old term. Again, I've been, I've been doing this stuff for 37 years <laughs> and doing a lot of business automation modeling. It's a really effective way of making sure we don't have any manual steps that aren't taken care of with services or applications. Hence the name automation model. It's taking a business workflow and showing what levels of automation exist. Now, in cases of manual entry, we could have a user interface or even just specify a row that says manual. Uh, but we can now take this artifact, this business automation model, and now kind of model our enterprise system model. Now we have information about which services communicate with each other and which services are fairly standalone. And notice here, the placement service is very standalone, as is the trade router service. Uh, the broker service doesn't communicate with anybody else, but the blocking service does communicate with it. And right here, we have inter-service communication. Once an order is validated, it then communicates with pre-trade compliance. And here, we can see, based on these two kind of workflows, the interactions between the services. It's highly useful for being able to determine uh, the um, coupling levels between the uh, services. All right, so this has been lesson 152, just, to, just another technique to put in your toolbox for modeling distributed workflows and also to validate those workflows. Make sure we have the right roles and responsibility for our services based on that workflow. Uh, manage the workflow, especially when changes occur to that workflow, and to make sure that we're in compliance with full automation of some of these business workflows. So thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned in two more Mondays for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.